Hello and welcome. We are delighted to see so many people on the line for this webinar, examining the validity of clinical social risk screening tools. I am Yuri Cartier. I am a research associate at SIREN, the Social Interventions Research and Evaluation Network, and I will be moderating today's webinar. So today's discussion focuses on the validity of clinic-based social risk screening tools, and as most of you probably realize, there has been a rapid proliferation of social risk screening tools that are being used in clinical settings across the U.S. Um, so today, we are going to spend some time exploring what we know about these tools, but also talk more broadly about what validity itself means and why it matters. And the webinar today is funded through a PCORI Eugene Washington Engagement Award, and we thank them for their support. Before we dive in, I will just share some important housekeeping items. So we will be recording this session, uh, and presenter slides will be available on our next website next week. And uh, we'll take participants' questions following the two presentations, uh, so you can use the chat feature of the webinar platform to send us your questions uh, throughout the session. For those of you who are not familiar with SIREN, we are an initiative housed at the University of California, San Francisco, and our mission is to catalyze and disseminate high-quality research that advances healthcare sector efforts to improve health equity by addressing social risks. And we do three main things, catalyze and conduct high-quality research, provide evaluation, research, and analytics consultation services, and collect and disseminate research findings. And we have a great evidence library that summarizes the existing research on this topic. Uh, we also have an online table that compares screening tools. And um, if you're not subscribed yet, we have a monthly newsletter where you can find out about the latest developments in the field. So I encourage you to visit our website and uh, check those things out. I would now like to introduce our speakers today. Our first speaker is Nora Henriksen. Nora is an assistant investigator at the Kaiser Permanente Washington Health Research Institute, and she will be presenting the results of a systematic review her team conducted to synthesize the available research evidence on the validity of different multi-domain social risk screening tools. Rich Sheward is the Director of Innovative Partnership at Children's Health Watch, and Rich will be delving into the research behind the development of questions in two social risk domains, in particular, food insecurity and housing instability. And for those of you who've just joined us, my name is Yuri Cartier, and I'm moderating today's webinar. Before I turn it over to Nora, uh, I just have a reminder for those who are just connecting to the webinar. We are recording this webinar and making the recording and slides available um, on our website, and we are doing questions at the end of um, Rich and Nora's presentation, so please chat your questions in the box as we go. All right, uh, now it is over to you, Nora. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, thanks for having me. I'm Nora Henriksen. I um, am an investigator at Kaiser Permanente Washington in Seattle, and I'm happy to be joining um, you today to talk a little bit about a project that we are just finishing up. Um, so I'll introduce our study team. Um, this was uh, funding that we got from internal funds through our research institute's um, development funds because we recognized, um, along with um, Kara Lewis, who's sort of our, the, the co, our co-lead on this project, we recognized that there was a need to understand a little bit more about, um, given the rapid proliferation that Yuri mentioned um, of tools in this space, um, what the measurement, sort of what the state of the, of the science with a measurement around these tools were. Um, so we assembled a wonderful team, including Dr. Gottlieb from SIREN um, and Caroline also, um, and I forgot to add Consuelo Norris, who was the um, project manager for this, for this project. 
So just a little bit, um, stepping back a little bit to, to describe how we on our team were thinking about screening for the purposes of this project. Um, you know, we were think we we follow what the the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force, um, how they think about benefits and harms of screening um, in terms of not only being able to identify um, risk itself or identify um, some something itself, um, but also its ability to have intervention follow that that's successful and not harmful and then at the end of the day really lead to improved health outcomes, um, including quality of life and, you know, conceptualized very broadly. So when we started this project, this is really the, the kind of conceptual model that we were thinking of as um, holding the, the bar for, for screening tools to and really being able to improve the health of our patients. Um, and so in this particular example, it's not a social risk example, but the idea is that for, and let me see if I can use the pointer here. So, or maybe I'm highlighting instead. But so here for screening for um, pregnant women um, for depression, if we weren't confident that we could accurately identify who was depressed and who was not, we certainly wouldn't be able to feel um, confident at the end of you know years down the road when interventions were starting to to be implemented um, that that the we were accurately, um, in, you know, showing the effect on um, improved depression and other health outcomes also. So that's just an example to sort of show, like, the space that we're in beginning this project. Um, and the context for screening for social risk, there certainly is a clear pathway through which um, screening for social risk in clinical settings could improve health. And that, of course, is by um, doing screening that's accurate and <laughs> reliable and also, um, and then detecting that risk, um, intervening on that risk somehow, um, either through, I think in this space, through referrals or through some maybe sort of direct um, intervention in a clinic setting. And then ideally that would lead to improvement in that, in that risk um, or in that need. And that would we ideally would be able to to demonstrate, um, given that we're we're at Kaiser in a health you know in a healthcare delivery system that we're demonstrating improved health health outcomes for our members at the end of the day and for patients everywhere of, of course. Um, as has already been mentioned, there's a huge uh, momentum right now around screening in this space, clinic-based screening, and so we we're trying to we we were thinking we need to really understand what's happening with the measurement. Um, piece now so we can start to identify if there's any gaps or needs in the literature, recognizing that, you know, validating these tools takes years and years and years, um, or it can, and, um, but this was intended just to be a snapshot in time, um, or hopefully early on in the process of our understanding of these screening tools. So again, this is our little conceptual model, you know, and the, the focus of our um, review was over here, um, which we're not thinking about interventions on for this particular project at this time, but really about the screening tools that have been developed um, and then their measurement properties, both psychometric and um, pragmatic properties. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means. So an ideal screening tool, um, we think, would be both psychometrically strong and also easy to use in practice and probably many of us um, here today are familiar with tools that are have very strong measurement properties but are really not anything that would ever be um, something that would feasibly implemented in a busy clinic setting. So we conceptualize those for the psychometric properties as um, valid, so something that both accurately and precisely measures a social risk domain of interest, um, and also reliable, so something that is consistent, consistently can measure the same thing over time um, and with repeated measures, including if there's changes in that risk. And also there's a set of um, gold standard measure development processes, that thing I mentioned about lasting years and years, um, but we, we also were interested in how uh, measures had been um, developed against some of these gold standard processes. Um, and then on the pragmatic side, we were interested um, in, and Dr. Lewis, who's on our team, has developed a, a 
uh, rating measure that I'll talk a little bit more about. So we want them to be short enough to be feasibly administered in practice, um, easy to administer and score rapidly in a clinical setting, and then also accessible in terms of cost. So our objective for this study was to evaluate the current state of multi-domain screening tools intended for screening for social risk in healthcare settings. Um, we had four research questions. Um, one was to what degree have gold standard methods been used in developing these risk screening tools? Um, second, what is the available psychometric evidence for these tools? Third, what is the available pragmatic evidence for these tools? And then fourth, what is the relationship between the psychometric and the pragmatic evidence? We conducted a systematic review um, of tools developed and published in two of the big databases um, to make 2018. Um, we also conducted, um, we had sort of a two-phase process, one to identify the screening tools themselves, which we used a systematic review process for that, um, in addition to consulting with experts um, on the SIREN team and others to identify, make sure we had a fairly complete list of screening tools. And then once we had a list of tools that we thought was fairly um, complete, we did a manual search to identify examples of where that had been used and published upon in the peer-reviewed literature um, in practice. And that helped us understand the uses of those tools and any modifications that might have been made. Um, the inclusion criteria um, are we limited it to US-based measures, and this was a fairly small, it was a short time frame for the study, and we were, some of this was logistic constraints and budget constraints for our team. Um, but we limited to US-based measures, um, those that measured two or more social risk domains, and the rationale for that was thinking through to um, a place in a healthcare setting that would maybe want to be screening for multiple things at once. Um, and then also we limited it to tools that had been intended for use in clinical settings versus um, purely for a research set, a research project. And then I'll talk a little bit about more about all the data that we abstracted um, for the included studies. Um, these are the six domains of social risk that we were interested in for this study. These were um, adapted from the Healthy People list, from the Kaiser Family Foundation list, and from the WHO um, uh, taxonomies of social, social needs. So we were, um, this was what we adapted for and considered included um, domains for this project. And then we abstracted evidence um, on use of these eight steps of measure development. So first, was there evidence on that the construct was clearly defined, um, that initial questions were developed using expert um, input, that the, the tool was pilot tested uh, with a representative sample, um, including validity and reliability testing, and then that that tool was refined based on pilot results um, and then re-administered again to a priority population or a focused population and then performing of testing again on that and then reporting those properties. We also abstracted information on how tools were modified um, in actual practice when we looked at the empiric uses of each tool. So this is the scale that I mentioned. It's called PAPERS, and I um, should remember what it stands for, but it is a, it's an innovative measure that Dr. Lewis has developed with her team that allows us to rate uh, both the psychometric properties and the pragmatic properties of a tool all in one, um, in one scale. And so this is how we both um, you guided our data abstraction about each of these, and then um, how we how we assessed um, the score. And so the scoring is here. There's 
for the psychometric, um, the scoring is from negative 9 to up to 36 for the quality, and this will come up later um, in the results. And then for the pragmatic side, it was um, negative 5 to 20 um, was the range of possible um, values for each of these scores. And so we, um, the paper scale doesn't have sort of um, benchmarks in its own process of measure development doesn't have um, clear benchmarks yet of what is sort of good or bad within this is all a relative scale. So we um, we just developed, um, we assessed in our, um, in this review, we just did quartiles. So we, we um, the four, we divided each of these sets of properties and this ranges of score into quartiles and described um, which which fell, how many tools fell into which quartile. So we, um, that's how we did that. And I will talk about the psychometric properties more in a second. So these are the psychometric properties um, that we talk about. And this was something that this is a real specialty of Dr. Lewis's and has really brought a strength to the to the project for this. So we, if you can see here, the the ones that are starred, um, these are the ones that we thought would be most interest, most applicable or especially applicable in this particular space of screening for social needs. So, so those three you see here on this slide um, as being particularly relevant. So this idea of construct validity or known groups validity um, is the idea that distinct groups with different characteristics can be differentiated. So you can see in um, in the space of social needs um, risk assessment, you would want to be able to identify people who had a certain um, social risk um, and, and then to understand how they were different and that they were different from people who did not have a certain um, social risk in a given domain. And then the predictive validity is this idea to which a measure, the degree to which a measure can predict um, an outcome of interest um, at some point in the future. So since there's such a strong need to, and so much urgency around addressing these needs in our members and in our patients, um, and to intervene quickly, we certainly thought that this criteria would be would be particularly important when we as we start to think about intervention, so we can be able to be confident that a measure that we pick in an intervention setting could actually be able to, um, you know, has the measurement properties to be able to show that we we made or did not make um, a change in that outcome. And then this idea of responsiveness where it can um, detect changes over time and how the, the risk in this space, how the risk would change over time. And then the other um, criteria are listed here. I think in the interest of time, I won't go too much into these, um, but these are the ideas around you know, others, other constructs of um, related to validity and how they connect with each other and also reliability about um, test and retest. And then at the bottom here, norms, these are, this is the reporting of sample size and means and standard deviations. And you'll see our tools in our study did a very good job of doing that. So um, a little bit about their results. Um, 21 unique screening tools met our inclusion criteria. This on the right is, um, we don't need to go into to every single box related to this, but it shows the flow through our systematic review process um, and some of the reasons for exclusion. Um, the most common ones were around um, not being you know, a multi-domain tool, for example. Um, and so we ended up with 21 unique tools and then um, 60 records total that were included that were describing empiric uses of these tools. So in the included tools, um, there were three to six domains assessed. The median was four. The most common um, of those domains assessed were those around neighborhood or physical environment, and also that economic or financial risk were the most common. Um, they were fairly evenly distributed as whether they were intended for adult or pediatric populations or both. Um, most were administered in ambulatory care. We did not exclude 
tools that were used in hospital settings, um, but most of them ended up being in ambulatory care. And there was a median of three empiric uses for each tool. And um, again, echoing Yuri's comments in the beginning, um, you can see that there's been a rapid proliferation of tool development over time. And so this was, you know, especially in the last five years, there's been um, a lot of tools that have, have been developed, which is very exciting. So these are the tools um, that were included. Um, we've been really careful not to um, talk too much about each individual tool or to make a recommendation about one thing being better than another because it's so situation dependent and so forth. But this is the, this is the list of tools that met our inclusion criteria. And then so our first research question about um, to what degree have gold standard methods been used in measured development for these, these tools. Not a single one reported following all eight steps of gold standard measured development. And I don't know that that's a bad thing. So I don't know that I've ever seen a tool that is not very, very mature that has, not, that has used all eight. Um, but most did approach, did, um, we found evidence or reporting that at least one step had been used. Um, and, you know, eight of the 21 reported some kind of reliability or validity testing. And then of interest, 15 of the 21 reported modifications from the original tool. So this typically would be dropping items or adding items and um, modifying response options. And I know as a scientist and other project, I'm, I'm, I've done this to tools also. Um, but when you think about, you know, building a body of evidence around a tool when these are, these modifications happen and are not reported transparently, it can be a challenge to, um, to the measurement property to assessing the validity overall. And then the second question, what is the psychometric evidence? Um, there was very little psychometric evidence. Again, this is not necessarily a surprise given how new this field is and how rapidly emerging these tools are. Um, so it's again a statement of, of a snapshot in time of those three. Um, um, there was no data on discriminant validity, known groups validity, structural validity, or responsiveness. So none of those had it. We were not able to identify any of those. Um, and the, but there was, um, for 15 of the 21 tools, this was the most commonly available psychometric was on norm. So again, those means and standard deviations and sample sizes and um, initial um, results. So that was, that was available on a fair number of tools. Um, the psychometric score um, was fairly low. So all of the included tools were in the lowest quartile of possible scores. So there was really very little evidence available. And this is not to say that any tool is bad. It's just that we weren't able to identify um, evidence of measured development in this, this particular space. And so those three psychometric properties that I mentioned in the beginning, this just shows that we thought would be particularly important in this space, being able to differentiate um, people of certain risk groups, um, whether the measure can correlate with outcomes of interest, and um, the responsiveness about detecting change over time. There was really very little data for any tool um, at the time that we ended our, our search. It was a different story for the pragmatic evidence, um, which was our third research question. So it was available, there was some evidence available for most tools. Um, the majority were in the public domain, which is a low cost option. So that's very accessible. The majority were written in um, a very an accessible reading level. Um, there was less evidence available for the ease of training and scoring. Um, and the tools tended to be kind of long. So only five of the tools contained under um, 10 items. 
Um, and you, when you think about a sort of busy clinical setting and people being screened every time they come in, maybe ideally you'd want something a little bit on the shorter side. But again, also as tools develop, sometimes they become shorter, you know, and sort of brief versions get developed and so forth. So about half of this, the half of the tools included were in the top two quartiles on the pragmatic evidence um, range. So when we had this question about the relationship between psychometric and pragmatic evidence, um, because it'd be interesting to be able to identify tools that were really psychometrically strong, but pragmatically strong or not strong, and be able to compare those side by side, um, we weren't able to do that because of the lack of psychometric evidence. So just a couple discussion points. Um, again, there have been many new tools that have been exploding into this place, especially in the last five years. Um, they appear to, many of them, have favorable pragmatic properties. They're readable, low cost, fairly easily administered, um, but there's very little psychometric information that, that we could um, identify. Um, and the majority of the tools have been modified from the original. So we concluded that at present there appeared to not to be no, no social risk screening tools that, that are designed to accurately and differentially identify risk between known groups, um, detect changes over time, measure impacts of an intervention. But we will say that we know that some tools, the, the measurement work and validation work is proceeding and we know of, we're aware of some publications that are coming out. So that's great. So this is just a, a snapshot um, in time. So um, to acknowledge some of the limitations of our work, that focus on U.S. settings, I mean, it, there certainly could be tools that were developed in other countries that would be applicable here, but um, we limited our focus to the U.S.-based ones. Um, again, we focused on um, tools developed for clinical settings, so there could be some tools that were developed strictly in a research setting that, that we would not have assessed for this study. Um, and again, it was, you know, we, in, we intended this and hope that it can serve as a benchmark for future uh, work and um, can be updated at some point in the future, but it is just a snapshot. So again, we need, this is in terms of future research and potential um, gaps and opportunities, there's certainly a need for psychometric properties um, about these tools, especially as we get into wanting to develop interventions um, and do strong observational studies about identifying and responding and intervening on social risk in clinical settings. Um, and then um, we hope that when folks need to be updating or adapting tools, which is totally understandable and often needs to happen um, to the degree that there can be documentation about that, I think that and transparency about the, the rationale and the specifics about what the adaptations are, that helps um, measurement the, me the measurement on the measurement side um, sort of build the case for, for validity and reliability of these, these measures. And again, we hope that this could be um, considered a benchmark for future progress. So for we, we have a couple of resources to, um, to point um, you all to. Um, our results um, and our Data can be viewed at this website here. It's a little bit of a mouthful, but we have made um, the, the rating piece available. And you're welcome to, that's publicly available through our, our website. Um, Yuri mentioned Siren has a wonderful evidence library of tools that they've developed. And then this publication, this study, we've submitted this as um, a systematic review to the American Journal of Preventive Medicine and that publication is under review at this time. So we are hopeful that that will um, be published at some point. It has more, more detail about everything that we've shown here. And so um, I thank you for your attention and um, back to you, Yuri. Great, thank you so much, Nora. Well, I'd like to turn it over directly uh, to Rich Sheward now, and um, once Rich finishes his presentation, then we'll do the Q&A for uh, both speakers. Over to you, Rich. Okay, thanks so much, Yuri. 
Hi everybody, we're going to dig in now to examining uh, the evidence behind the hunger vital sign as well as the housing stability vital sign developed by uh, researchers and colleagues at Children's Health Watch. So the roadmap for the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to share a little bit about Children's Health Watch for those who are not already familiar with the organization, and then we'll jump right into looking at the hunger vital sign, the validation study that we conducted, as well as subsequent studies that have come out since and how that's been implemented in the real world. We'll then move on to the housing stability vital sign, our conceptual definition of housing stability and how we conducted that study and how that's being implemented today. So very quickly, Children's Health Watch was founded in 1998. We're a nonpartisan pediatric research and policy network headquartered at Boston Medical Center, operating in five cities in the U.S. in safety net hospital settings uh, in Boston, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Little Rock, and Minneapolis. And we collect data in frontline healthcare settings from families with young children facing economic hardships such as food insecurity, housing instability, energy insecurity, healthcare hardships, so on and so forth. Our goal, our mission is to improve the health and development of young children in the United States by alleviating and addressing these economic hardships and informing public policies that are going to improve children's health. So over the past 20 years, we've published our findings from the research and the conversations we've had with families in over 43 journal articles. We've spoken to uh, over 65,000 families, uh, caregivers and young children, and we've leveraged that research to have an impact on public policies. And all of the families in our data set, that's what feeds into the research that we conduct. And so what we're going to talk about first is the 2010 pediatrics paper that we published, uh, which became a vital sign. I'll just quickly note that for these publications that I'm describing, there are short links available so that you can access these papers. And when those slides are available, you'll be able to access these papers quite easily. So this study was based off of the 18-item USDA Household Food Security Survey, which serves as the gold standard in the assessment of household food security in the United States. And that's what we use to validate the two-item hunger, vital signs, food insecurity screening tool. And one thing to know about the USDA Household Food Security Survey is that um, according to established procedures from the USDA, households are classified as food insecure if they endorse three or more affirmative responses to, 18, to the 18 questions. So when we developed the hunger vital sign, we included consideration of sensitivity, being this screen's ability to correctly identify food insecure households, as well as specificity, the screen's ability to correctly identify food secure households, as well as convergent validity, the correspondence between the screen and theoretically related variables. And again, when we developed this screening tool uh, based on the USDA tool, we had five specific characteristics in mind. We wanted it to be applicable to families with young children, especially in a clinic setting, healthcare clinic setting. We wanted it to be brief, given that setting and the constraints. We wanted it to be highly sensitive, so having a sensitivity over 90%, highly specific over 80%, and to have uh, convergent validity. So what were the questions? In our validation study establishing the hunger vital sign, we found that most respondents who lived in food insecure households affirmatively answered, often true or sometimes true versus never true, to the first two questions of the household food security survey. So that was 92.5% and 81.9% respectively answering affirmative to the first two questions on the USDA 18 item. And so these questions are here on the screen. And this is what comprises the hunger vital sign. Now, why did we settle on two questions and not just one? So cross-tabulation tables were generated for the combinations of these first two questions to examine sensitivity and specificity. We explored four combinations. 
an affirmative response to question one only or question two only provided a sensitivity of 93 and 82 and a specificity of 85 and 95 respectively. An affirmative response to both questions one and two provided a sensitivity of 78% and a specificity of 96%. However, an affirmative response to either question one and or question two of the 18 item provided the highest sensitivity of 97 and a very high specificity of 83. Therefore, these are the criteria that comprise the food insecurity screening tool. This is a small table. Uh, we'll look at the results in just a second, but we conducted logistic regression models uh, using both the 18 item and the 2 item to examine how food insecurity status was related to child and caregiver health outcomes while controlling for covariates, so getting at the validity of it. What we found was that compared with caregivers in food secure households, those in food insecure households, is measured by the hunger vital sign, where it's significantly more likely to report their child's health as fair or poor, report their own health as fair or poor, and have a positive depression screening result. And compared to those in food secure households, children from food insecure households is measured by the hunger vital sign, were more likely to have had hospitalizations in their lifetime and were more likely to be at developmental risk. And we found that these associations were statistically significant and very similar to, the two, although slightly weaker than the corresponding associations with the 18-item Household Food Security Survey, which demonstrates convergent validity of the house, uh, hunger vital sign as a measure of food insecurity. And again, we conducted further analysis looking at whether households identified as food insecure by the hunger vital sign experience risk despite being classified as food secure by the 18 item. Again, to be considered food insecure on the USA 18 item, you have to answer affirmatively to three or more. If you answer affirmatively to one or two, in the case of the hunger vital sign, you would be considered marginally food secure. And what we found was that um, even marginal food security, which is technically what the hunger vital sign measures, demonstrated statistically significant associations with poor child and caregiver health outcomes. We went on to publish those findings in 2013. And then beyond just the research of Children's Health Watch, in 2015, Dr. Tamara Baer and her colleagues validated the use of the hunger vital sign in an adolescent patient population. And following in 2017, doctors Craig Gunderson and Hillary Seligman and colleagues validated use of the hunger vital sign in high risk US adults, essentially completing the arc of understanding that the hunger vital sign is a valid tool for use across the lifespan. And again, we're only just sort of touching the surface on what has happened since that 2010 study. So questions have arisen as to um, why use both questions? Can we just use the first one or the second one? And can the wording of the questions be changed and the response options be changed from three item to a binary? And what's very interesting is that in 2017, Dr. Jennifer Makalarski and colleagues examined these, uh, the common uh, implementation issue of the response options. And they found that using a yes or no binary response versus often true, sometimes true, versus never true, this is nearly a quarter of food insecure patients and lowers the sensitivity of the tool. And this really just serves to remind us of the dangers associated with tampering with screens that have been used um, as in previous validation studies. And again, I mentioned we're sort of just touching on the surface of what has happened since that 2010 study. Um, just a quick Google Scholar search shows that the hunger vital sign study has been cited in hundreds of other studies, other researchers looking at other issues, especially around the modality of the screening, whether it's verbal or paper or electronic, and uh, more studies that can be covered here. But I do want to note that in 2015, the American Academy of Pediatrics policy statement, and then the subsequent 2017 National Academy of Medicine, Cannibal Health Communities Model screening tool articles that came out really increase attention to this hunger vital sign and 
it's been um, adopted and used even more since then. But now I want to quickly jump to housing stability. So this is a, a, was a slightly different research experience for us at Children's Health Watch. And the way that we essentially conceptualize housing stability is similar to an iceberg. So what we see plainly is homelessness. It's very apparent. However, there is a large amount of hidden homelessness, which we consider part of housing instability. So families that are behind on rent and experiencing multiple moves and even experiencing unaffordable housing. And our conception, our framework for understanding housing stability and housing instability has changed over time. So in 2011, we published findings from our research in HAPH looking at multiple moves and overcrowding. And then we began investigating homelessness during pregnancy, which we call prenatal homelessness. And then following up, looking at homelessness during infancy, the first year of life postnatal homelessness. And again, there are links to these uh, papers here that you will have access to. We continued our research and looked at the timing and duration of pre- and postnatal homelessness separately and together, found a bit of a compounding effect in terms of health outcomes and outcomes associated with other hardships. And then in 2018, sort of where we've landed at our current understanding of housing instability. And that's what we'll talk about right now, the housing stability vital sign. So we're looking at folks who are behind on rent or mortgage, who have experienced multiple moves. That means living in two or more places in the last year, as well as homelessness. And the uh, study that we conducted, which was published in Pediatrics in 2008, was among just over 20,000 families, and just over a third of them had experienced at least one of these adverse housing circumstances. So 27% were behind on rent, 8% experienced multiple moves, and 12% had a history of homelessness. And each one of these individual circumstances was associated um, uh, statistically significantly with adverse health outcomes and material hardships like food insecurity, energy and, uh, security, and healthcare hardships. What we also found was that there was little overlap among each of the circumstances. So each question is capturing a different group essentially of patients with different housing risks that are associated with health outcomes and other hardships. And looking at the findings, these are our adjusted odds ratios here. They were all statistically significant. What we think is quite interesting is that the behind on rent group looks quite similar to the multiple moves group, as well as the homelessness group, considering health status outcomes. And in some cases, the behind on rent group is actually looking worse among other household hardships, especially around energy insecurity and healthcare trade-offs, really sort of signaling that these are the families that are struggling to keep themselves um, at or above water. But what were the limitations of this study? What made it um, interesting and in some ways difficult? So comparing uh, housing instability to the world of food insecurity, the field is still undecided on what exactly constitutes housing instability, even the term housing instability versus housing insecurity. So whereas there is a clearly defined terminology and conceptual framework that the USDA has developed in understanding food security and the scale of it, there is no equivalent um, among HUD, for instance. There's also no gold standard. There's no 18-item um, household security survey, for instance. And so what we did in this study was examine the relationship between these three housing circumstances based off of our previous research and understanding and health and hardship outcomes. And we know that more, uh, more research is really needed in this field. We expanded on the 2018 paper in another paper in 2019 uh, published in the journal Zero to Three, looking at the implications for practice. So really, why should 
health care screen for housing stability as well as other social determinants and how should health care providers screen for housing instability in clinical settings? What does that landscape really look like? And uh, that paper is also available here on our website. But what does this all really mean? And it boils down to whether you're looking at food insecurity or housing instability or a number of other health-related social needs to begin with finding your why. Why are you conducting social need screening in the first place? What are you hoping to achieve by doing that? And so once you have clarity on your why, you'll have a point of reference going forward for everything that you do. It begets confidence in understanding whether you're using the right tool for the purposes that you've set out, and it's followed by action in the work that you do every day. So those are my closing thoughts for you on all of this. I want to say thanks, and uh, I will turn it back over to Yuri. Great. Well, thank you, Rich, and, um, and thank you, Nora, as well, for both of your really informative and really thought-provoking uh, presentations. We have just about 15 minutes now uh, to take questions from the audience, and so remember that you can continue to chat uh, in your questions. Um, so we have quite a few so far. Um, and um, uh, Nora, I'm going to start with you. Um, there have been a few questions that have come in about inclusion. Um, so maybe I can group these together. Um, could you explain quickly why um, you included only the US-based tools? Um, somebody suggested that there also might be tools in social work and social service um, settings, so um, why you didn't include those. And uh, someone had a specific question about have you looked at the Arizona uh, self-sufficiency matrix? Uh, yeah, I appreciate that question. We um, we 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 had a small amount of funding for a one-year project, and so we had to make some decisions um, around scope that we certainly would have loved to do something larger. Um, and so I think we we made decisions about scoping that reflected what was of most interest to the team and the research question and those were, you know, US based tools in clinical settings. I certainly we certainly recognize that there are um tools developed in other countries that might be wonderful and perfectly suited to this or adapted to this from um the social social work space for sure. Um and that's certainly something we recognize as a limitation, but we we had to make some some tough decisions about scoping so we could be feel good about the slice that we did um pick out. So I hope that helps. And then as far as the specific the Arizona tool, um I'd have to go back and check if that um came up and was assessed um that we reviewed that. I don't have that in front of me, unfortunately. Um, great, thank you. And um, kind of following on um, the the gold, the idea of gold standard uh, tool development and context. We have a couple questions here. Um, one person who's asking that: Do you think that the difference between a traditional clinic setting and a community health setting are significant in affecting validity and reliability? Um, and also a question asking kind of to what extent are gold standards universal or community dependent, i.e. different in different cultures? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I, my understanding is that part of the, the sort of grand, you know, validation process includes um, validation in different cultures and different populations. Um, and so I think that's, you know, what we see with some of the very um, mature you know, measurement tools out there like quality of life measures and so forth is that there, there's very clear evidence about what what populations that they have been validated for and there's a process, you know, those studies certainly should be conducted. Um, but my understanding is that for the the tools, you know, that's part of the transparency of the tool development process is clarity about which populations that they and which settings that they, they are validated for. Is that help? 
Yes, thank you. That's excellent. Um, and somebody asked us to uh, pull up uh, your slide showing the different um, social risk domains um, mm -hmm. that you looked at. So we have just pulled that up. Um, and kind of relatedly, uh, someone asked, you mentioned that economic stability was one area of content focus for tools and was wondering if you could share a list of which tools did best at screening for financial health, such as debt and medical debt. <laughs> that I would direct, I don't have that in front of me, I would direct folks to the website that we, um, I think Carolyn posted it, um, that, that shows, you know, we, our intent was really, um, even though it was maybe um, for better or for worse, our intent was not to sort of come out of this project with a recommendation for specific practitioners about specific tools or to endorse um, a certain tool because we weren't we weren't doing this for our particular setting at Kaiser Permanente necessarily, though we hope to benefit from this also um, from the results of this study. So we don't have any way to sort of say which tools did the best because it's, you know, we were hoping to, to relay the degree of um, variation and to describe, you know, how somebody might go about choosing a tool that's appropriate for their setting and that's why we built the website um, that we did. So I can't really, you know, I can't really comment on like which tool did the best in which area, but that should all be available on the website, how many, how many you know, which items do assess those economic um, stability needs. Great, thank you. Um, and maybe this is a similar question in terms of how um, this person might use the website. Um, they ask, has there been work demonstrating a screening tools criterion or predictive validity related to clinical risk or health outcomes? And so how might they use the website to, to find the answer to that? Yeah, I think that would be great. We actually did not. Um, we didn't abstract that, and I don't know that th that specific of I don't know that that they would find that on the website. Um, but the idea around pre predictive validity about whether that that can be tied to a health outcome, I think might there might be um, some information there. I think in general, what we saw was that a lot of these tools are really not yet. Um, developed to the point where they're really making connections with health outcomes, and that's certainly what we would like to see for any screening tools and certainly where we hope the field is going to be able to have robust measures that can be connected and show impacts on health outcomes. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take you off the hot seat for a little while, Nora, um, and direct this next question to Rich. Um, since the AAP's recommendation for food insecurity screening, um, someone was wondering, has there been work that evaluates implementation in clinical settings and outcomes? Yeah, there, there has been um, a bit of research on this, and I'm, I'm pretty confident that folks would be able to locate that in the Siren Evidence Library. I know uh, colleagues of ours um, in Philadelphia at St. Christopher's and CHOP have uh, looked at this. They looked in part at the acceptability among patients, especially caregivers of children. They also looked at the modality of it, um, whether it was um, conducted uh, verbally or um, self-administered. I know that um, there are other studies out there, um, but it's a small but growing area. So yes, there is evidence out there looking at the implementation of it in clinical settings. I think you know maybe more so on the outcomes is where there are unanswered questions, but ripe for more evidence. Absolutely. Um, and we have a question asking if there's been investigation on the effectiveness and validity of the housing instability screen for adults. That's a great question. Uh, so at our uh, home institution, Boston Medical Center, we are studying the use of this screening tool with uh, an intervention in a randomized control trial uh, among families with children, but this is also being used in work at BMC with uh, high-risk adults. And I believe that there's um, some research that's going into that. Um, my colleague uh, and our principal investigator, Dr. Megan Sandell, and our uh, Director of Policy Strategy, Alison Bovell-Ammon, are the ones leading that work. And so 
you know, using just BMC in the Boston Medical Center ACO as a laboratory. I know that there's work looking at specifically adults in that sense. The, the program is called Housing Prescriptions as Healthcare. Great. Um, I have a question about um, that is kind of for both of you, um, asking if you could comment on how actionable uh, figured in to the evaluation of screening tools. Sure. Well, I'm happy to just speak quickly to the, the hunger vital sign. So that was a huge priority for Children's Health Watch in doing the validation study was that we really wanted it to be brief, that it could um, be used within the context of a 15-minute clini clinical pediatric visit. And so, you know, rather than use um, a more lengthy um, food security scale, even the abbreviated versions that the USC has, like the six item, for instance, we really wanted to make it um, able to implement in an easy, quick way, which is what uh, resulted in the two questions. Yeah, and I would say that this is Nora. I would say that the um, when we were selecting the the risk domains that we were going to focus on for the review, we we wanted to focus more on modifiable risk. You know, so so there are certainly some measures of risk. I mean, of social determinants that are not modifiable, and we tried to we tried to limit our our focus to those that might be amenable to intervention. Excellent. Um, so going back to um, the domains, Nora, quickly, somebody was asking about um, immigration being uh, a domain that you considered in the in the screening tools. And it looks like it wasn't, but maybe if, maybe you were considering it in your domains. Um, yeah, I think we did include it in the domains, yeah. OK. Um, and um, there's been some questions about screening um, in general. Um, somebody asked a question and maybe a, a bit of um, a, a request for comments from you about um, how to kind of balance the um, the tension between the improved outcomes from identifying social risks and um, a risk of increasing stigma or bias towards high-risk patients, and maybe how that showed up in, in your respective projects. Um, I'm not sure I understand the, the, I think there's certainly plenty of potential harms that could come from screening, and you know we would certainly advocate for being able to set up studies and measurement tools that would be able to allow to assess those those um, potential harms and labeling and stigma in the absence of intervention is certainly, I think, among those um, as a potential harm. We weren't, you know, we were so focused on the measurement properties for this one that we didn't get into that of measuring that. Um, but I certainly agree that that's an important field of study, which is why we put it up in the in the beginning of our slide. I don't know if that gets at the question, but that's just yeah, a little bit of reflection, yeah. Yeah, and in our experience, I know there are studies that have looked at the acceptability of food insecurity screening um, using the hunger vital sign and that it has been acceptable to patients. Um, and that's been both examined uh, quantitatively as well as qualitatively. There's a recent report that just came out looking at that. Um, and also, I'll direct people to the work of uh, Dr. Arvind Garg, who has examined the, the harms and unintended consequences associated with screening and has put some good thought into that as well. Great. And of course, we have um, a webinar that we did uh, last month on um, the acceptability of social risk screening, for which we have the recording and the slides. Uh, on our website, so I would encourage you to check out the SIREN website for that as well. Um, it looks like we have 
very few minutes um, <laughs> compared to the number of questions that uh, have yet to be answered. So we'll be sending um, the questions to the speakers and giving them the opportunity to answer offline um, and post the answers on the web page where we post the recording. Um, but um, I'd like to end on uh, a, an implication question. So um, we'd love to hear what you think the implications of your work are for, um, and this person asked about health social workers, but I'm, I'd like to kind of broaden it um, to, um, to people uh, working on social interventions in healthcare settings more broadly. So this is Nora. I would say I think that I'm hoping that, that the work that we did can contribute to a body of work that really allows for the development of, of measures that are robust enough to detect, um, you know, the effectiveness of an intervention, which is we know is so sorely needed to serve our patients better. And, and this is Rich. I'll just add that, um, you know, it's, it's very easy to uh, sort of gloss over the fact that, you know, the hunger vital sign is two questions and it seems so simple, but these questions are actually addressing a very sensitive topic for individuals and families. And so the implica implications for social workers and all healthcare or community agency staff is really to think about the sensitive sensitive nature of these questions as well as other health-related social needs questions and to really have clarity on why you're asking these, what you're going to do when you receive an answer, and how you're, um, you know, taking into account the, the holistic care of that patient when using a social risk screening tool. Excellent. I couldn't agree more. Um, so I want to thank both of you, Nora and Rich, again, for your excellent presentations. Um, and I want to thank you all for your great questions. Uh, again, we'll be putting the slides and recording up on our website as soon as we can, so probably early next week. And I want to make one last request. It is so helpful for us to get your feedback on what you got out of this webinar. So please uh, fill out the evaluation. We'll be sending it to you by email in a few minutes, or if you want to do it now, which is even better, the link is here on the screen and in the chat box. Um, that is it. In closing, uh, thank you for joining us, and we wish you all a great rest of the day. Thank you so much. This concludes today's call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.